When you're talking about tried and true American classic shotguns, there is one that stands out above the rest, the Browning Auto 5. And I actually don't think that's unfair or sensationalist towards Remington and Mossberg and Ithaca. This gun is more recognizable than any of them, has probably sold more than most of them, and has such a unique place in so many people's hearts. I have been reviewing guns for years now, and I have never had one of these on the channel, and so I went to the Holtz sealed bid auction because I couldn't get my hands on one that I could be honest and true about without offending an owner because all the owners are so in love with them and uh, paid 90 pounds for this bad boy. Before we get into the history, the design and whether this is actually a good gun or whether it's just got a weird cult following, let's see if it works. Holts don't sell stuff that's dangerous. It's all in proof uh, and the barrels and stuff are measured up. Let's just uh, see whether this goes bang for starters. And it ejected. I mean, I don't know why I didn't contemplate that more. I could have died. This is where this gets cool. You ready for this? Auto cartridge pickup. One of the things that makes this gun so popular is that it's so faff free. You only have to have to put cartridges in one way. You never need to put it in the side. All right, we've got two in there. My suggestion is now that we uh, shoot some clays with it. It works! I was expecting the clay that came out last time. Dodgy Barbary buttons. I mean, it works! It works! 90 quid for a Brownie Water 5 that works. I mean, it is a dog. It's got a fully cracked forend and it's missing half the rib. Semi ribless. Before I take this back, Josh Brown, England team shooters, just walked over and I'm going to second him to see whether he thinks this is a good gun. Because I, I know it's a good gun. The world knows it's a good gun. And I have to convince him, a man who much like many people in England and the world who thinks this is old junk, that it's not. Let me introduce you to the Brownie Auto 5 if you've never seen a humpback before, mate. This is one of the most iconic guns ever built. First designed in 1905 and made up until, what, I think eight years ago, then yeah. re-released with a different recoil system. But this is a long recoiling gun that means, you're like this, when it goes bang, the barrel moves back. That is an artillery piece, very popular all over the world, being used in various wars by the military, by various police forces, probably as a shotgun killed more ducks and deer than many others. Don't look down on it. it can break clays. That is a Ferrari California. Here you go. Oh, fat, hold on. I like this. This is the coolest bit. You ready for this? Ready, ready, ready? Come on, there, yeah, it's pretty sick, right? This was a gun designed by a man who really wanted you to kill shit. Three shot. Three shot. Four. I mean, that's quite cool, isn't it? <laughs> Is it working or not? Cool. Come on, then. Verdict after three shots. It's weird though, isn't it? Because you pull the trigger and it sort of jumps back in your shoulder. You yeah, really but then it. it pulls forward afterwards. There's a lot goes on with an Auto 5. You can keep that. <laughs> I mean, he broke three out of three targets. He broke three out of three targets, Josh. That's pretty impressive. So what did I buy? What does 90 pounds buy you? Well, it buys you a working shotgun from Holt Seal Bid, which is pretty shocking. It doesn't buy you a lot in the Auto 5 market. What's interesting about these things that certainly in America and in England, they hold great value second hand. And that's because they were built properly. They have a steel barrel, a steel receiver, proper walnut forend, proper walnut stock, hand polished, hand fitted internals, all made in Belgium. Which is interesting that it's classed as American classic really when it's designed by Browning but made by FN. And I understand there are American built versions by Remington. This is an interesting beast. This particular one is not very nice, but it does work. And that is a testament to the abuse that this gun can take. The finish is all but gone on the barrel. If you look, you have more brown than black. That is not in good condition. And I'd love to know the story behind this. It is missing two interbridge bits of its rib. That in itself is pretty fascinating, isn't it? I do not know what the story is there. Did someone try and bend out some bends? I can't see any benefit to having those there unless it perhaps had something strapped on the bottom like a torch, which it could have done, you know. This was a gun designed to put food on the table and across the world it has done that. 90 pounds doesn't buy you a pretty one, that is for sure. And yet it's still got a lot of charm. Let's shoot some more targets because, oh man, the smile an Auto 5 puts on your face is epic. I will show you this one more time and explain what it's about. This is the quick loading thing. Let me show you this one more time. Most semi-autos you have to put the cartridge in the side and press the button. 
This gun, you don't have to do that. What you do, quite simply, is load straight in the ramp. The ramp is one piece with a bevel cut out of it. You won't bite your finger so readily on an Auto 5, which is quite nice because you've got a fat lump, lump at the bottom. This is a machine thing, not a stamped thing, and that's good. You put the cartridge in, then you take your thumb out. Because the bolt is back, the stop for the mag tube is missing, and that flies back in like that. I think it probably needs to be seen in slow-mo. It might be an American classic. They can keep it. Honestly, I have not struggled to shoot a gun like that for a long time. I need to have a look at it. I feel like she's not very well. People have been asking for this review for a while, and once I had bought this from Holtz Auctioneer's sealed bid, and it being the cheapest, nastiest one they had, because I didn't want to invest good money in one, because I remembered subconsciously that the first, second, and third, and fourth times I shot one of these, I didn't really enjoy the experience that much. I can usually learn to shoot guns pretty fast, and the Browning Auto 5 is something I've always struggled with, probably because it was built for a smaller, different shape of human being. The action itself is actually totally epic. It's the first mass-produced, probably longest serving or longest made semi-automatic in the world. Originally designed in 1898 by JMB, it was first produced then in 1900 and it was produced all the way up until 1998. That's 98 years of production of the same thing. It was then re-released a few years ago, but it's not really the same gun. The silhouette may be the same, but I will controversially say I much prefer the new one because I can shoot and hit stuff with them. It's certainly a less historic gun, the new one, but I feel like this is a bit of an albatrossy Jonah of a gun to me. We've never got on, and as such, I can never really look at it with the same love and affection I do other guns. What do I have here? What did 90 of my English pounds buy? Well, it's an Auto 5. The Auto 5 is a long recoil operated semi-automatic first designed by John Moses Browning a hundred and something years ago. It's pretty wild. At the back we have a walnut stock. They come in all sorts of variants. Pistol grip and straight hand are the more common ones. It has a plastic FN heel plate at the back because nobody in America wanted to make Browning semi-automatics for the price and commission that Browning wanted. So we went to Belgium. At this point I'm going to combat the, is this an American classic? I think Americans can only have 50% of this. The other 50% as they go to the Belgians. They made it. And as such, maybe this is a Belgian classic. There are many Belgian classics. So this is half theirs. There are a few Belgian classics. That's not very nice, is it? They're a very historically important country. You have the long tang on the bottom that houses all the mechanism, and that goes down the back as well. It's a pretty nice thing. The grip is huge. This is a practical user's gun. You're designed to take this out with a big trigger guard. It's not actually that big. With a big gloved hand, a proper man's gun. It's the first thing you notice, how big that is. The safety catch is oversized to be right-handed with lovely little cutouts so you don't cut your finger. It's steel. This is a gun made from an era where steel was king. And in many ways, I suppose you could argue it could still be, but quality alloys now do allow really good feeling stuff that lasts just as long. But there's still something about picking up a steel action gun with steel bits. It's quite nice, isn't it? The gun is long action recoiling, so when you pull the trigger, as you've probably seen in super slow-mo, the whole barrel comes back, and you have to be careful because the barrel's got bits missing. Comes back, all the way to the back, the barrel then flies forward on the spring that's in the forend, we'll look at in a sec, the cartridge ejects, and the bolt comes forward to pick up a new cartridge. It's funny, isn't it, that when you look back through history, you realise how complicated this is versus something like that Benelli breeder inertia system. I think maybe a gas system is actually more complicated in a semi-automatic to make, or probably similarly, but the number of parts and the quality of regulation that this gun required is way different. To load, it's simple. One in the bottom speed load, or load four up the bottom, two in this case, because we're in England and it's restricted for shotgun certificate, two plus one, but standard four plus one. You can load four in the bottom and very quickly charge it. That will then drop forward if there's a cartridge loaded and you're ready for action, safety off. The 16 gauge version of this is often called the Sweet 16, or it is called a Sweet 16. It's a nice thing. The scaled action in the 16 and the 20 do make this gun a little more elegant. That humpback receiver, which is what it's called, the Browning humpback, is not everybody's taste. To so many it will mean a lot, but to the rest of us it just 
it is what it is. And it has to have that because of that long recoil. And I guess they could have then shaped it off and made it longer and moved the trigger back potentially, but then you would have been talking, I mean, like a nearly a foot long piece of steel, if not more, including the safety tank. It would have been a big, heavy, horrible beast. It's just interesting to me that the man who invented the 1897 pump with the bolt that came out the back, maybe there would have been like a cool crossover there. Although pulling the trigger with a semi-automatic with a thing that flies out the back, I know there's a couple of pistols and rifles that do that, but when you're in the heat of the moment hunting, uh, there would have been a lot of one-eyed hunters around. So I should have thought about that before I said it. But it's out there in public now and people know that I don't think things through before I say them. It's got a mag cutoff. That's quite a cool thing. That was a fairly early innovation in the grand scheme of things. This is really handy in certain hunting scenarios where you're going out on a multi-species hunt. I have never used a mag cutoff in my life. But if you've got one in the chamber and two in the mag, let's say you've got bird shot in there and you hear a deer coming, you can flick your mag cutoff, rack your bird shot out and very quickly drop a slug or some buckshot in there. Again, it's not that applicable in England where we generally will hunt for one species at a time over short periods of time. When this gun was built, you could shoot deer with a shotgun, but you can't nowadays. It's a really nicely machined thing. The actual quality of finish, certainly when you were looking at Ithaca 37s and other guns of the era, this gun stands out above the rest. And perhaps that's because it's made in Belgium by FN and you know they were, they've always made very high quality firearms, but it is a beautifully finished gun. That loading ramp, for me is one of my favorite parts, the lifter. It's big, it's solid, it's steel, and kind of embodies what this gun is all about. This is the way that it should be. It doesn't matter if it's too big or too expensive. Nowadays, you wouldn't see any makers using a piece like that. It would be a thin stamped piece of budget steel or alloy, and it would be perfectly serviceable. But this just feels big. It's like an old muscle car, isn't it? Like there's no turbos here. This is all naturally aspirated. The barrel on this one is a 27 inch, 26 inch ribbed, vented rib barrel. As you can see, the back part of the rib is lower because it actually goes back into the action when you shoot it. For some bizarre reason, somewhere along the course of its life, somebody has cut these two bridges out of the front. And having shot it, I realized that this rib is led on bent. And whether that was done before or after, or who knows when that happened, I don't know. But what I do know is that if you use the front bit of the rib, you hit more targets. If you use the whole rib, you miss high and right every time. That's not something I've ever encountered on Brownie before. One presumed this barrel has had a hard life somewhere along the line. Luckily, the barrels are interchangeable for the most part. And so, you have to really be careful. This is the perfect place to grab a gun and it's missing all this stuff. Pull that front knot off and you'll see how easy it is to change the barrels out. You can get ribless, ribbed, slug barrels, the works. The forehead is also broken into multiple pieces. This is a cautionary tale not to buy the cheapest gun you can find just because you want a gun. In fact, my gun cabinet is filled with cautionary tales like that. The barrel comes out and it is a particularly heavy barrel. I don't think it's got a weight, a weight stamp on it from the era it's from, but it is a particularly heavy barrel. It's very big, very thick. Again, a mark of the era, a mark of when it was designed. This was just the way things were done back then. The bolt locks forward with a single rising piece that comes into here. Again, like many semi-automatics up until recently when we all have rotating bolt heads, or for the majority have rotating bolt heads. There's no gas work because it's a recoil operated gun. What you do have is a friction ring. These are interchangeable to tune the gun for different loads if you want to do that. I think most of them, given that it's a 70 mil gun, there isn't that much variety in 70 mil cartridges. Or well, maybe there is. It's not something I've ever had to change, but I do have a friend who has one and he says if he plays around with it, he can get it cycling 24 gram 70 mil loads, which is, pretty wild. Whether that's true or not, I don't care. It's a good story. You have a big return spring and cleaning wise, these are pretty friendly. Like any long recoiling gun or recoil operated gun, there is a little less mess than a gas gun. That said, a long recoiling gun because of the way it operates is a little bit less friendly in terms of muck, but it's very easy to sort of spray it out, clean it out, wash it out because of the way it is. It's at this point that I do owe a lot of people an apology. There's a huge following for these and I know people love them. But I'm sorry, I just don't like them that much. I remember when I got the Cosme and did a few films in it, people were like, it's basically a Browning Auto 5. In only the same way that it's long recoil operated. Other than that, the Cosme is delicious and light and beautiful. This is a bruiser, a big, well-made bruiser. More importantly, I can't shoot with them. And you just can't fall in love with a gun you can't shoot. Engineering, historical value will only go so far, right? One day I'll try and find a more modern one which do go for really solid money, like the late 90s models. And I'll take it and shoot it. And having played with a few of those, they feel way better. 
they feel more modern, they just feel like something I could actually shoot. Alternatively, I won't do that, and I just won't shoot an Auto 5 up until the point when I have forgotten why I haven't shot an Auto 5 in a while. And this can go back into Holtz, and I'm sure it will make somebody really happy. I did have in my mind to get the new barrel and go out and shoot it and extend it and fit it, but I have a queue of stuff I need to do for myself on guns that I genuinely feel passion for. And this is an interesting thing, but it ain't for me. So interestingly, this whole experience has been kind of reminiscent of the first time that I shot an Auto 5. I remember pulling the trigger, it bouncing around, and it realizing that all Auto 5s, other than the new iteration, which we'll come on to in a second, were not made for me. The stock is 14 inches long, hugely droppy, it's got a really long cutback for that tang and all the inner workings before the nose comes up. It's not a comfortable gun to shoot. The technical issues that we've discussed aside, I remember not being able to shoot one that well last time because this was made for a very different man than me. JMB didn't have six foot seven British Scandinavian giants in mind uh, when he designed this gun. And that's okay, because Josh shot it extremely well, and he is the sort of person that this was designed for. Technically, this gun was a marvel of its time, and it does stand up to criticism today. The humpback design will probably divide your minds, but it is iconic, and being iconic is a good thing, right? It doesn't have to be svelte and beautiful. It can be a big bruiser. Is this an American classic? I mentioned earlier, I do have my concerns as to whether the Americans get ownership over the Auto 5. I do have my um, thoughts on whether this actually gets to count as an American classic. Just because it was very popular in America, I don't know whether you get this one, guys. I think the Belgians can have this one. I mean, they made it, they finished it, they made it what it is. Um, I don't know. I'd love to know your thoughts on that. Is it better than the new one. I mean, this will divide opinion more. I love the new Brownie Auto 5. It is not an Auto 5. A bit like the Defender and the Defender, right? This is a gun of another era, and the new Auto 5 is a gun that can compete with the likes of Beretta and Benelli. And I know you can go and put meat on the table with this gun and it will shoot and it will do everything you want. But I, yet out of the three, four Auto 5s that I've shot, more than a couple of shots through, have yet to find one that felt as good as a new one to me. There's nothing wrong with a classic, but there's also nothing wrong with new. Just because you appreciate this doesn't necessarily mean the new one's crap, and it is just like the new Defender sort of conversation, right? Either way, it's been my pleasure to share an Auto 5 with you finally. I am glad that it worked, but this has been an emotional roller coaster. Yes, it may have worked, but it didn't work for me. Guys, thanks for watching. Take care, and we'll see you next time. Thank you for watching guys. This channel is made possible by our amazing sponsors. You can find out more about them in the description down below. And if you wanna support the channel, you can join as a member. You get loads of extra content, well, some extra content, and occasionally we hook up and go clay shooting together as a membership group. If you don't feel like joining today, we really appreciate you watching and subscribing. Have a wonderful day.